Yeah, so this is a thing. Might as well talk about the continuity error right now because it really isn't a perfect time to talk about it. The continuity error I mentioned back when I discussed the diaries has morphed into two separate plot holes, and it's either really funny or sad how bad these guys are. Okay, so Miss Judgmental talks about the festival and then the tournament. She says this. Remember everyone, the vital festival is only a few months away. It won't be long before students from the other kingdoms start arriving in Vale, so keep practicing. All right, now it's not explicitly stated, but that made it seem like the tournament would be held during the festival. Okay, still with me? Skip ahead a few episodes to before the start of the festival, and we have an old man tying up a sign that says, Welcome to Vale. Now, most festivals are held for the townspeople and have very little to do with attracting tourists, and the sign that would be up would be about the festival, not welcoming visitors. So it would seem that attracting people is something this festival does, and one such event in a festival like this would be the martial arts tournament between different schools as kind of a micro-Olympics. I've heard that students visiting from Vacua will be arriving by ship today. And as a representative of Beacon, I feel as though it is my solemn duty to welcome them to this fine kingdom. Now she didn't explicitly state it was a tournament for the students, so it can be anything. But this is really starting to lean on my side of the argument. Then Weiss plans on spying on the students who she thought would arrive on that day in order to cheat her way into a win. So yeah, I'm gonna have to say I won this. With that said, we have two ways to take this. The tournament was supposed to be during the festival and they changed their mind in the writing process and pushed it off for a while. Or the students had a tournament that we didn't see and then the tournament that is being talked about in this season is just another tournament and this might be an every semester thing. The second continuity error comes from the second season. Just assuming that Beacon semesters are the same as every other school, why are the students from other schools just hanging around? Assuming that all of the schools have a similar school year, why would there be a student from another school when there's less than 24 hours before the semester starts? And it can't really be just Sun's friend, because no one seems to notice that he has a different uniform and they seem to be indifferent to his presence. So ignoring the fact that this old man took an entire semester and a winter slash summer break to reopen his store, we have a scene that seems alright on the surface, but even thinking a little bit about it takes it from a decent scene to a pretty terrible one. First I'm going to talk briefly about the sound design, then I'm going into a long-winded rant about the setup for this scene and how terrible it is by comparing it to Pulp Fiction. Okay, the sound design is pretty bad, but at least it's not just lazy foley work like in the first season. It's just highly inappropriate. So we have this guy shutting books like an asshole because he's an asshole. The first one sounds more like an actual book being shut, and the next 15 have this weird echo and explosion aspect to the end of it, and it just sounds awful. You can claim this is to be nitpicky of me, but it hits on a much larger problem that isn't nitpicking. Tone. See, this is supposed to be a scene in which people intimidate and kill someone like in a mobster movie. This sound effect, no matter what Rooster Teeth might be trying to infer here, takes the tension that was being built up and tosses it aside. I can make a joke by ruining a scene from another movie, but I'm hoping my audience isn't nearly as stupid to need me to do that for them. Alright, how does Pulp Fiction come into play? Well, in the similar scenes between the two, two henchmen banter a bit before going into the place to kill the dude. Then they go into an area in a nonchalant manner and the person they're going to kill is caught unaware. Then one of the two henchmen banters a bit with the person they're going to kill, and the second henchman messes about in the background and makes some noise every now and then. Then the main henchman stops messing around and threatens the guy. Then they kill the guy. And finally they leave in the same chill manner that they left. So I'm going to have to say that this scene was probably heavily inspired by Pulp Fiction's counterpart. The difference is in its presentation, writing, and believability. The banter in the beginning of this scene is used for character establishment in Pulp Fiction. Showing us who these characters are, what motivates them, showing us how they hold themselves, and what makes them angry. See, this guy doesn't like being proven wrong. And there is even a bit of appropriation here to add a bit more to the next scene. Ruby does the same, but with a lackluster result. It does establish the characters, but in a more bland and generic way. We learn that this girl is a thief, and that she dislikes her companion, but we don't know why. We learn that the guy is an asshole, but nothing more than that. And yeah, it's much shorter than Pulp Fiction scene, but they had enough time to do something with it, and it would have helped. Now the banter with the victim is where the scene becomes fairly unbelievable. So in Pulp Fiction, there is Samuel L. Jackson doing his sweet thing in which he terrorizes the poor young man with his wit. Everything that is said was either inspired by objects in the room or by conversation that he had had moments ago. There are still scripted aspects in it, but the entire conversation seemed natural and not forced. In Ruby, it all seems planned and scripted out. The amount of time and effort needed for them to have the knowledge necessary to have this conversation is baffling. How does a pit pocketer know some of the rarer books, and what if he had it? Two lines of that conversation would have been ruined. 
And even if you can look past all that, there's still some really stupid things in it. Here's a quick one. Hey, do you have any comics? Near the front. How is this supposed to be interpreted? He is in the front of the store. I know you didn't want to animate him moving, but you could write around that. Tell him it's on his left. Bam, not stupid. And there's one final thing. No one cares in Pulp Fiction that he shot a couple of guys, and it's because he's in a really poor neighborhood. Crime happens a lot, and people just don't want to be shot. They're not going to care, and they're going to keep their heads down. This seems like a pretty nice store with a lot of buildings around. Where are the cops, and why does it seem like no one has noticed anything? Now for the very next scene, we have something that should have put my faith back into the show, but instead somehow it lowers the bar for me. How do you mess up one of the easiest things ever that can be easily done without any research? Now ignoring this is, seriously, you just want me to nitpick the show, don't you? We hit the scene that I'm guessing is supposed to win me back, but again, these guys have no idea what they're doing. Again, tone is important. It's pretty much the same as the last scene, but infinitely less complex. It's a food fight. How the hell do you mess up a food fight? Well, let's discuss it, shall we? Have you ever seen a food fight? Because they're really happy most of the time. The growling and the angry faces doesn't make much sense in this context. Maybe if it was between Ruby and Jonas' team fighting against Cardin and his team, I could get it. There's a lot of tension there, so I can see being more serious. But this is not the case. By the way, great face rigging. Let's just pretend that the show was properly written and the character's actions have consequences. And let's see what happens. So Nora rips a pipe out of the wall and uses it to smash Ruby in the face. So she's dead. Then Weiss picks up a swordfish and pierces her in the chest with it. So she's dead. And then Nora smashes Weiss into a pillow with said pipe. And so she's dead. Then again smashes Yang through the ceiling, killing her as well. Then Pierre does that tornado thing with the pop cans and kills Blake. Then Ruby being upset that she somehow survived being hit in the face with a pipe completely murders all of John's team, leaving her as the sole survivor out of the original eight of them. Yeah, it's a bit nitpicky, but you could have made this scene in a way that I couldn't have brought up any of these points and I'd be sitting here with my foot in my mouth. Either way, realism, at the very least within the world you have created, makes the show more immersive and less pointlessly stupid. What the hell are you doing? That's basically explosive material you're just throwing out of the plane down a ramp when it could explode at any minute. This is turning out just like the divorce. Oh. Spare us the thought of you procreating. Yes, because a loveless marriage that ends in bitter divorce in which the kids go live with one of the parents and not often visited by the other really reminds me of sex. I decided to take it upon ourselves to kill the rat. I think he was some sort of cat, actually. What, like a puma? Yeah, there you go. Oh, no. That's not good at all. That's probably the worst thing I've ever heard. If there's a sign that not only will Ruby get worse, but Rooster Teeth as a whole, that would be it. Oh, thank you, Miles Almighty. I was going to make this whole point of professional hitmen doing pretty petty things like picketing pockets for the fun of it being horribly unprofessional, and any respectable mob boss would have scolded them for making the organization look bad. <sighs> then I realized she was talking about killing the store owner, and then I felt a little bit sad. A point for the positive, but a weaker point than I originally thought. Why wasn't this job done sooner? Uh... Huh? Uh? Uh? Is that a lot? Because without further context, he's bragging about what he had already stole months ago, or even what could have been stolen from a single freighter. And I'm going to be pretty upset if the whole thing was orchestrated by Schneed just to get the price of dust up. Episode 2. That scene was pointlessly dramatic, and why did they need to have a conversation like that in person? It would have been much better if they had just had a conversation between friends catching up, and then out would slip the impending war. This just seems like an overly scripted scene with a stupidly dramatic moment between people that are going out of their way not to tell each other what's going on. Like it was meant to be there to allude to the audience. <laughs> You're in the damn library, shut your damn mouths! And this is such an obnoxious scene! It feels like someone heard from someone who watched a game of Risk play out, and it just makes no sense. Who just walks up in the middle of a game and asks if they can play, especially after they just got told to study? And then there's Weiss being so poorly written that it makes no sense. She attacked her own fleet? She didn't even make a move, and her entire army got destroyed. And she's still holding the cards after she lost. Why the hell is this scene so bad? It's like watching an awful sitcom trying to show what cool kids are like. It hurts. 
And it's the entire episode. So during the food fight in the entire first semester, the wife thing doing bad things doesn't bother you. But now that you know, truly, truly know, and have witnessed firsthand what they are doing, you are now all depressed about it. Outside of the fact that this is stupid that it is now affecting her, why is it affecting you to the point where it's killing you? But whatever, let her mope for the dumbest reasons. Now I did cheat a little bit as I saw bits and pieces of the other episodes before watching this one, so I know that she's still going crazy over this retarded plot device. But even still, having not actually watched any further, I am really getting the sense that this will be something that permeates throughout the entire season. As you know, in order to enroll at my academy, students must first pass a rigorous entrance exam. <laughs> Oh, I know you're just messing with me. Damn, that turned fast. Did we really need the all-wise and all-knowing Ospin to suddenly lose his clairvoyance in order to have this little spiel with Blake? Well, the answer is yes, because without this moment, there's no establishing for the whole Blake going crazy thing because she's dumber than a bag of rocks. No kidding, there is nothing that provides a rational transition from nothing wrong to has to stop defangs. And there are two things that conflict this moment outside of it being a plot device. If Ospin is the same character as he has been before, shouldn't he be smarter or at least more perceptive and notice the fact that Blake is not in the best mindset for an interrogation? I get that there's this massive thing going on in the backgrounds, but is Blake really a suspect? You know, ignoring the monkey faunus that is now hanging around the school for no particular reason outside to hunt Blake? And then, would this even be enough to push her over the edge? Is being asked whether or not you're a member of the White Fang really that bad for you when the answer is simply, I'm not a member of the White Fang? And then Ospin asks a pretty stupid question. And what are you? I, I don't understand what you're asking. How did you know the White Fang would be at the shipyard tonight? And instead of Blake answering the proper way, which is I'm a huntress in training and a faunus, completely dispelling this point in the scene, she lets the speculation go. And then he drops it immediately after that line. For those of you not getting what I'm saying, is all I'm asking for is it to be good. And if it can't be good, then at least let it be entertaining. If it's not entertaining, then at least let it be realistic. And if it is not realistic, then at least keep it consistent. And when you can't keep your terrible story consistent in its ineptitude, you have to give me some scenes that have some weight in them. And when you denied me the most basic of these needs, it bothers me to no end. All of us, that you would let us know if something was wrong. So, Lake Belladonna... What is wrong? See, wait. Okay, between blowing up nightclubs, stopping thieves, and fighting for freedom, I'm sure the three of you think you're all ready to go out and apprehend these ne'er-do-wells. Uh, who? But let me once again be the voice of reason. We're students. We're not ready to handle this sort of situation. See, Wise is completely right. Okay, she's not right at all, but, you know, if the show was well written, then she would be right. If you could stop them now, then sure, go for it. But as students, you are learning and growing pretty quickly. By the time something happens, you should be much better than you are right now, and you'd be more able to stop them in that instance. If the show was, if the show was well written. Just train your asses off and put more time into everything than anyone else does, and when you become a Super Saiyan, you just beat up the bad guys. Remember, he can block shotgun shots at close range. You need some help. Damn it, this is starting to get pretty bad. Okay, I'm willing to believe that for some reason students are allowed to walk around the school, even with the threat of war looming, but whatever, it could easily just be there to keep the students from panicking. But it is night! Why are there foreign students wandering the halls in the middle of the night? Is this a community college or is this a military school? Forget how completely convenient it is that she would forget the game, and even more so that she would run into these guys just then. How do you write this and say to yourself, Nah, man, this is great. Nothing wrong here. Exchange students have their own dorms. Yeah, explain the problem in the scene with a greater problem. Go ahead. I'm still watching. But I don't know why. Episode 3. How does Yang have shady connections when she's a freshman in high school? I know kids sell and buy drugs in school, but this seems to be a bit bigger than that. We are going to investigate the situation as a team. Sorry, son. We don't want to get friends involved if we don't have to. Okay. Okay, back up to, come on guys, no one is going to stop the White Fang unless we do, and we'll be dead by then if we don't start now. Why are you trying to avoid his help? I know she might not like him that much, but isn't this a problem? Like, she would have done all the work by herself if she wasn't stopped by Weiss. So why is the team suddenly important? Shouldn't you want all the help you can get? Ooh, 
Dude, look at me. My name is Weiss. I know facts. I'm rich. <coughs> is that supposed to be a joke? Cause it's not a joke. Nope. Not doing it anymore. The writers have to be high on lead to believe that it's either funny or well written. It wasn't that long ago that she was involved in an incident. Why is a top secret test android just walking around without supervision in a foreign kingdom? Holy hell man, we get it. She had a falling out with her family. Just show us once or twice. That's all that's needed. The sigh when she hears her name and once again before she makes the call is all that is necessary in order to establish this. Why is Penny standing alone? The last thing said between them is it's not safe to talk here. So wouldn't they just walk somewhere safe to talk together? And then they're just walking down a busy street. Not hiding, not staying away from people. So this is all extremely unnecessary. I robot Hancock. <laughs> Those credits are the best thing ever. <laughs> Episode 4. Oh hey, the trailers that didn't matter at all now starting to matter. So is Ruby's mom dead or dad dead or how is Yang related? You know, four episodes in and we have yet to find out. This is going to pay off pretty well, isn't it? Stop, stop. Nobody shoot. <clears throat> Blondie, you're here. Why? Damn. I'm not sure which is worse, that line read or the line itself. Oh, good. A freshman is drinking alcohol now. That's nice. Okay. Okay, sorry to go into another rant, but why are Blade's tits jiggling all the time? This destroys all the tension and just stupid-ass fan service that's not needed at all. And you might say, why are you staring at the breasts? But I'm not. There are so many animation errors I have to force myself to focus on the head and torso just not to smash my head with a hammer. If you don't believe me, just watch any scene in this entire show and look at people's hands. Not a single finger moves ever, and it's so bad it hurts. And rather than just not show the hands I move in the camera a little bit, they leave them in there like stiff false hands on a dead-eyed mannequin standing in the mall. This reminds me of Ninja Guy, where if you shake the damn control, the tits go everywhere. It ruined the tone then, and it ruined the tone here. Of all the stuff that doesn't move and is stiff and unmannered, even rigged for the engine, why does Blake tits need to be applied to them? He can't see in the dark. Don't let him get away! Um, what? I get that they turn out the lights to prevent the human from seeing where they went, but what about the shit ton of faunas that are there? Why did this work? They're surrounded by a bunch of faunas. They could have been easily grabbed by the 15 guys standing around them. Not to mention it took them a while to get out of there. You used a smoke screen on a robot. You know, things that normally have ways of detecting things outside of the visual cameras. Like radar and heat vision. You used a smoke screen on that. Well, you're lucky it worked out. Ha! Monty already used that in Dead Fantasy. What? Episode 5. So Cardin's dead. Oh yeah, I forgot. The show's bad. Why is he here? Are the fans of the show so completely brain dead or are they willing to forgive stupid shit like this because they're retarded? Yeah, Ospin sure did miss that. I forfeit. <sighs> Naruto. Naruto did it. No, what was that? Whoa, 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 what was that? Did I just hear you say she gets stronger the more she gets hit? That is wrong on every level. Ignoring the minor crap about the robot being able to punch someone that fast and then fighting that slowly and ignoring the less minor crap of the power she has been given being extremely overpowered and horrifyingly underwhelming, this goes against established continuity. It would have been pretty sad if it was just she got angry and powered up like that, you know, some kind of prissy hulk. But nope, let's just ignore everything we've written in the past and just make some shit up as we go. Who needs character establishment or development? Just wing the shit. <laughs> this is so funny. Now I have to play this clip. <laughs> Just tie the crazy woman up and force her to rest. She is acting irrationally and if she gets worse, I throw her into a mental institution just to make sure she doesn't screw up the investigation. Date or no date, none of this will matter if we can't get Blake to go. Um, no, it does matter. You need some R&R. &R. And if Blake isn't willing to get either R, then you need to leave her behind before she gets the whole team killed. It's not about overpowering the enemy. It's about taking away what power they have. Again, I'm not sure what's worse. The line read or the line that was read. 
It's just corny, stupid dialogue that's not clever or witty in the, even in the slightest. If you're taking away their power, then you're overpowering them. Episode 6. <laughs> Racism. Get it? Because she's a cat? Yeah, the funnest thing really isn't a sore spot for her at all. Go ahead, poke fun. We're not actually together. Together. Nora, I said headphones on! <sighs> okay, okay, that was funny. Damn it, Nora and Ren are the best part of the show, and they have had no screen time this season. Sad, isn't it? Why are you doing this again? The same conversation held in the same manner isn't going to do anything. Except for it's going to work because of some overly pouty speech given to us in an overly dramatic fashion. Wow, this scene was bad. Even ended in the hugged you back to sense cliche. How come every arc in this series is centered on a profoundly inept concept? And finally we figured out how they are related. I told you the payoff wasn't going to be all that great. Why are they here? Episode 7. Don't you hate that guy? Yeah, you, you hate that guy. Why are you dancing with him? Okay, okay. This was an amazing episode and I really did enjoy it. Yeah, there were a lot of stuff in it that I could nitpick, but frankly, when an episode whisks me away with dialogue that wasn't grinding and plot elements so inept it could kill a man, I have a really hard time caring about them, or even being bothered by them. If this was the entire show, I would love this and wholeheartedly recommend it to others, but sadly, this is not the entire show, and it is really bad most of the time. Well, here's hoping that the rest of it is much better and doesn't sink back into the really bad territory. Now I'm kind of mad that they made me in on such a weak note. Well, better insult them one more time, just for good measure. Ingway, I'm on! <laughs>